Thank you, Rachel. So uh, welcome, uh, everyone. I'm Rémi Lemonnier, uh, co-founder and president of Cybeds. Uh, so as you might expect from the CEO of a successful international company, I speak perfectly fluent English, but I will nonetheless deliver this keynote with a hint of French accent. <laughs> because I believe deep down this is how English should be spoken. <laughs> so I'm a data scientist and um, a machine learning engineer in uh, my, my background. But uh, six years ago, I decided to found Cybeds uh, because I believe that uh, digital advertising needed fresh thinking in a category that I think is critical for its future, uh, how we decide who sees what ad and when. And so we came up with a pretty unique approach to, to this challenge. Uh, so Cybeds AI uh, builds a custom bidding algorithm for each digital ad campaign in a DSP, uh, which are specific to their business goals and needs. And you know, a few years ago when we started, uh, bid optimization capabilities were buried quite deep in a marketer uh, tech stack, but um, we've seen a sharp increase in uh, demand for uh, differentiated AI services uh, since brands realize that the uniqueness of, the, of their challenges uh, cannot be met by one size fits all approaches. But we're not really here to talk too much about Cybit. Instead, I want to present to you the, the result of a study we commissioned about how you, um, top executive at uh, brands and agencies in the UK market, think about what's next for the industry. So we will publish soon the result in their entirety, and you can give us a, a follow on Twitter to be notified. But I will unveil the first result here, and then in the follow-up discussion. So first, when, when the results came in, uh, I was a, a, a bit concerned, because what I was really the most interested to learn about is what's the one main challenge, the one opportunity everyone is identifying. And we got a lot of different answers to that. So I started to, to ask myself, is that possible that no one agrees on what's the most important for the industry moving forward? Okay. But then it, 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 it all made sense. So um, what, what we discovered is that uh, marketing leadership in the UK uh, want to get ahead of the big shift in the landscape. Simply put, uh, they want to do the right things right now. And I think it can be fairly well characterized by respect. So re respect for data and the users that provide us this data, what we call privacy-preserving advertising, respect for the environment, we just talked about, um, reducing carbon footprint of di digital advertising, and respect for humans, the humans operators running the campaign, making sure they, they, uh, they are equipped with the technology to elevate their capacity and effectiveness. So I call these, these three aspirations a virtuous advertising, and I'm going to deep dive in each one of them and try to show why AI can be a solution to, uh, to, this, um, to these challenges. So first, respect for data. We all know that contextual data is making a comeback. Uh, so how do UK marketers regard this opportunity and you know, what signals are they uh, currently testing? So actually, the, the answer is quite a lot, and that's not surprising since uh, we are a bit of an experimenting phase right now in the market. Um, but what really struck me as, as an untapped, untapped opportunity is um, the, the fourth one you, you see here, which, is the, which are the contextual logs present in the build request. And only 25% of respondents said they were leveraging uh, this source of data. While at Cybiz, we think that it's a very, very important source of data. It's the one we've built our, our technology on because we think it's a, it's a large scale, it's unexploited uh, semantic data. Um, that is the most privacy-preserving data on the web. It's scalable and it's free. So maybe the message here is that while it's completely natural to um, uh, try new, new shiny objects like the Topics API or attention metrics, we should not forget about valuable tools right in front of us. And actually, I, I believe that getting this right is existential. Uh, if we want to implement privacy-preserving advertising, uh, we cannot uh, try to replace the old targeting techniques by new ones or to wander into fingerprinting territory. But instead, we have to be able to exploit to its full, fullest e extent uh, the contextual data set we have in front of us. And this means, I think, using more sophisticated methods like AI to, to exploit really these contextual data sets. And I firmly believe that we can get, at the same time, uh, more campaign efficiency, uh, but also reducing cross-site tracking of users. Uh, another topic that r resonated also a lot with me is uh, environment respecting advertising. Um, and this was, you know, reducing carbon emissions was simply seated as the most, as the number one market trend 
by respondent. So the, the, this, this strike me, and I, I ask our friend uh, Brian O'Kelly, uh, can, you, you know, can you give me a rough estimate of what's the average carbon footprint of an impression? Of course, it, de it depends on a lot of factors, but the rough estimate he gave me was 10 cents CPM, and I found that absolutely huge, meaning that depending on the format, it could very well represent like 10% of the actual CPM, meaning that if a brand wanted to offset the cost of their carbon emission, they might need to add an extra 10% to the advertising budget, and it's a lot of money. So, you know, how can we reduce uh, this footprint? This has been discussed a little bit in the, in the panel previously, but I think one main solution is to use fewer ads, but more impactful ads. Um, like for privacy, if you want to do good by the planet, we need, we need to be able to um, do more with less. And obviously this means that advertisers need beforehand to identify which ads are going to be worth a lot to them and which, are, which ads are going to be almost worthless. And again, here, AI is a good tool to identify, uh, I mean, to, to bring the best performance for campaign with fewer impressions and at, at the same time um, uh, pilot the, the trade-off between performance and resource consumption. And finally, um, respect for humans. So the number one challenge uh, identified by, by respondent um, for the next years to come was scarcity of expertise. And I can relate to that as a business owner because I know when I have trouble recruiting, it means that my team are putting, uh, are putting in long hours and their work-life balance is threatened. Um, so when a whole industry cites scarcity of expertise as a number one challenge, it means that every manager uh, should think about how to provide their team with the technology to make their work more insightful, more meaningful, but also make sure that this work does not become their whole life. Now, of course, as much as I like AI, uh, I know that it's never going to automate most of the tasks task we are doing. Actually, AI is better at very few specific tasks, like uh, crunching a very large amount of data or computing optimal uh, bid prices. But I think more importantly, for most of tasks, AI is able to increase the quality of insight humans can then uh, operate on, uh, elevating our work and making the human touch uh, more, more effective. So thanks a lot for, for your attention. Uh, I'm really excited to be in, the, in this industry in interesting times and to be in this growing category, which is AI. And now let's move on to the fireside chat with my colleagues Matt from Exchange Warrior and Sylvia Sparry from Gaxes. Thanks for introducing those findings, Remy. It's been hugely, hugely in, um, interesting to run the, run the study with you guys and looking forward to diving, diving into those findings in a bit more depth. Um, so firstly, um, where respondents we talked about yesterday in terms of you know, brands wanting to use their um, business metrics to inform their ad decisioning, but 36% of brands were uncertain how to do so. So how can they and the industry go about addressing this uncertainty, Sylvia? So, I think what's important for, for, uh, for this process is that, first of all, we need to figure out what advertisers really want to achieve. So, what the business objectives are that they care most about. So, sustainability should be part of that. But also, you know, what are the commercial metrics they need to achieve. And then we need to dig deeper and figure out what data sets advertisers have available. So, you know, that could be sales data, that could be data you know, directly from any e-commerce sites that they have or that they work with. But it could also be other, uh, other factors like the uh, stock level um, in their warehouses, for example. And then we ingest that data and figure out you know, what the right performance metric is, that it is a blend of all of these metrics and codify that into the AI to optimize. That's what I would say. Thank you. And Remy, how do you see it from, from your side? Well, I, I agree 100%. I think uh, the main challenge here is to, to bridge the gap between the, the real business metrics brands care about. And these metrics have increased in sophistication over the years, whereas it is a multi-touch attribution model or footfall measurement or you know, measuring a TV effectiveness now with CTV. And, but the bridge between these metrics, the brand care about, and the media KPIs that are used for decisioning every day, taking billions of decisions or bidding, bidding non, not bidding, um, well, this bridge has to be built. And it's a case-by-case -case, um, thing, and uh, as I, th I think that like, you know, AI sophisticated methods uh, are, are a good tool here. 
helpful. So I'm looking forward to seeing how those, those solutions develop. Um, moving on, obviously, we touched yesterday in one of the panels on, on retail media. Um, obviously, it was on one of the slides earlier, but this was the second most um, you know, important trend cited by the study overall and joint most for agencies. So, Sylvia, I want to ask you, how can, how can agencies kind of realise their ambitions within, within retail media? Um, again, I think there's um, there are really kind of two major factors that that I think will drive the adoption of retail media. One is that it's a really rich data source because it, there's real purchase intent data um, that gives us a really clear signal, you know, where to pivot the media spend and where to spend it most effectively. Um, and the second one is that placing media in a retail environment, again, you're placing it in an environment where, where consumers are more willing to actually, you know, uh, spend, where, where they're more, more willing to um, associate, you know, the, uh, the, the consumer journey that they're currently going through, and you're potentially going to be able to pivot that to your product. So I think, I think it's a really interesting environment for, in, for us to interact with. It's, it's a little bit siloed, so I do find that, you know, the, uh, all of the retail media spaces where um, ad tech vendors could improve interoperability of the individual firewalled kind of systems that we're interacting with. So there's a lot of opportunity, but it's currently not made particularly easy for us as agencies to use it in an effective and scalable fashion. Hopefully solutions get bought to, to kind of realize, realize that. And Remy, similarly, um, the ability to leverage attention metrics was cited um, very highly within the study. How can, how can brands and agencies go about you know, incorporating these attention metrics into their, into their advertising? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I think attention is um, in this category of uh, new media KPIs, not really business metrics, but certainly better than viewability to capture a, a lot of things um, brands, brands really, really care about. And, you know, I think uh, brands should definitely uh, experiment with attention with maybe two, uh, two advices from, from my side. First, uh, attention is, is, is a new concept and a lot of different partners are, are putting different things behind it. So, you know, really understanding what's, what, what your partner uh, in, uh, is doing in measuring attention, how the score is built, is interesting. And then I think um, it's, it's a bit of a shame if it's just used as a post-campaign reporting tool. And what's really interesting is to use it for optimization. So either you optimize towards attention because you are really convinced that this is what's important for your business, or you optimize with attention, really um, uh, using this new metric in your decisioning, in your optimization. I think this is how brands are going to see the, the better result. Awesome. And in terms of moving to the second pillar, in terms of the um, respect for, for the environment, obviously, you know, in the previous panel, really insightful discussion about moving from, from actions, well, moving from concepts into, you know, actionable, um, actionable you know, actions. Um, how can AI be used to help, help brands? I think for, for first we, we, we need to be very humble on this topic because it, it's, it's very, very important and, uh, and uh, also it's quite, I mean, new in, in the market and a lot of things are, are going to be built in the next few years. We cannot predict uh, today. Um, I, I'd say maybe three, three things. The first, starting to measure the, the, the emissions. I mean, there are a few providers, uh, I know, uh, out there and it's, it's uh, not, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a first step. Uh, second, you know, it was touched also in the, in the panel before, uh, but you know, just uh, be more efficient with the ads, show fewer ads. I mean, spray and pray strategies are, are not uh, possible to have anymore if you want to be, to, to be carbon efficient. And I, I'd say third, uh, for a brand, just, just look, look into supply. And you know what's uh, clearly uh, a website that, that has a very long uh, loading time or that has like dozens of partners in their ads.txt uh, uh, file. Uh, has a, a huge carbon footprint, and so how can you, uh, you know, uh, integrate that in your me media buying decisions? I think you know, with either you you you, you curate your your inventory or you use uh, AI to have that in your decision. And Sylvia, how are you looking at it from from your perspective? Um, so I very much. Um you know, agree with the principle that you mentioned of, um, you know, delivering fewer and more impactful ads. Um, 
and I think a way of doing that is to really, you know, educate um, ourselves and the clients that we work with on, you know, the, the trade-offs of delivering ads that are not in view, delivering ads that, um, you know, are not interacted with, that might look great on the current performance metrics, but we, you know, there, there might have to be a repivot where we actually think about re-benchmarking um, how we view performance and how that is measured and what a, what a, what a, what CPM we should actually be paying for effective media, essentially. So there's that aspect. And I do think that um, there's, there are a lot of efforts that we're currently undertaking to try and codify some of that new best practice into our systems. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, at Group M, we've got a rep responsible media framework, uh, media investment framework. Um, within that, we have our brand safety principles, you know, how we manage inclusion lists and exclusion lists. That also includes um, priorities around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but then the environmental impact factors are very much codified into that as well. So that when our campaigns are started, they are warm started with all of those principles in mind, where you have inventory selections, technology vendor selections that are already pre-optimized to ensure that we deliver to the principles that we as a company sign up for. Awesome, and that um, kind of codifying of the um, ESG principles really leads us nicely into that final pillar in terms of respect for humans. Now, the study found that 34% of agency and brand marketers are currently not confident with their marketing stack. What more can be done to kind of reassure them? Remy. Well, I, I think uh, clearly, uh, you know, building trust in one's uh, marketing stack. So first, obviously, uh, you know, uh, first thing is to go talk to your to your partners, try try to understand exactly what um, what, what they are doing. Um, one wha one thing we see is that uh, the best marketing stack um, are the, the ones that are not um, uh, siloed, and where actually uh, every partner are working together uh, to reach the same overarching goal, which is at the end of the day maxima maximizing the business metrics of the brand. And, and we, we see that as habits, for instance, when we, we uh, you know, do the decisioning and optimization part, uh, but, uh, and we have access to the business metrics on one hand and the data sense on the other hand, the effectiveness is much more uh, important than you know, when, when, when the decisions are, are taken in silo. So that would be my advice. Awesome, and Sylvia, how are you you're approaching reassuring, reassuring brands? Again, I'm, I'm going to mention the word interoperability again, because I do see that with the demise of third-party cookies, there's just so much additional complexity introduced into the marketplace, and so many, you know, sometimes quite large and sometimes quite small um, firewalled environments for me to interact with. Um, and while there might be some short-term business interest in, you know, developing those more siloed solutions, in the long term, for me as a marketeer, that makes it very difficult to justify future investment because what I do need are solutions um, that I can build on, where I can build innovation for, um, where I myself can build innovation for our advertisers and, and, and you know, truly bring um, advertiser first party data in through the systems, um, through our own systems and then orchestrate um, performance optimization across those systems not do it in each of them individually. And, and with regards to the advice to advertisers, what I would say is that, you know, don't, don't um, rely on what you always used. With so much additional features being introduced into the marketplace, a solid test and learn strategy is incredibly important. So um, there's no one answer. There are hundreds of potential answers. We need to test them in a structured fashion. And then again, we need to codify what works into the systems that we use to warm start our campaigns and set them up for success. Again, leading us, nice, leading us nicely to my final question, um, and it's the kind of finding I found most interesting, as I, as I said to you guys before we started, and it's that 70% of the market is unsure of how to adapt to upcoming privacy changes. Like I said, I don't think there's going to be one single solution, um, but what steps can the industry take to, to adopt, adapt to these privacy changes, Remy? You yeah, know, I think this uh, uncertainty is, is understandable because... Uh, we are uh, allegedly one year away from you know, the, the big uh, cookie de deprecation. And if you look at the initiatives that are being built, uh, obviously a, lo a lot of work is, is being done, but, but they are not finished yet. You know, there, are, there are still a, a lot of uh, unknowns, a, a lot of moving paths. And, and also there are several, several, several of them. So you know, do we know which one is going to have the scale? And you know, 
how to start building against. So it, it, it's normal, I think, to have a level of uncertainty. However, I think so something is quite certain, is that in the long run, uh, the overall philosophy is that no data source that cannot, you know, uh, that is not justified, that, that does not support a very, very important use case for, for a tech is going to disappear. And I think this means that there are going to be mainly two data sources. First party data, meaning that, okay, still going to be uh, possible to do retargeting, for instance, but third party uh, targeting, third party audiences targeting is going to be much more difficult. And some sort of contextual data set, maybe aggregated at uh, dozens, uh, uh, at, you know, at a certain level of dozens of users, maybe with some random noise added into it in order to have what informaticians call uh, differential privacy, meaning that there is plausible de de deniability that a user is or is not in the data set. But still, at the end of the day, it's still going to be possible to know what contexts are very good for a campaign and what contexts are bad. And my advice for brands would be to, to you know, just draw their own conclusion of you know, what, what can be done with, with, with these two data sets. I think learning how to exploit very, very well the contextual data set is very important, and this can be done with, with AI. Awesome. And Sylvia, what steps are you taking? What steps do you think the, the industry should, should adopt? So, so I think to, to mention something that, that we haven't spoken about yet, um, for me, um, the thing that really keeps me up at night about all of this is measurement and how I can holistically measure specifically. Um, because for everything else, I do think that, you know, there, there will be very effective solutions for us, for example, to drive performance, to target and to optimize. I'm not worried about that at all. What I'm worried about, though, is how we will prove the effectiveness of our marketing spend and how to do that in a holistic fashion and how to assess, you know, um, how different inventory pools within these walled gardens compare in terms of performance. So, you know, if, if, I was a, if I was a CMO in this environment, I would think very clearly about what my current measurement framework looks like and what the measurement framework of the future needs to look like so that I can hold, um, I can hold the different media vendors that I'm working with accountable. Absolutely, and I think that accountability piece is going to be hugely, hugely critical going forward. Um, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, but um, the, re the research findings will shortly be available on Exchange Wire. Please read through them. Again, like I said, it's a hugely, hugely interesting read. And, but for now, Remy, Sylvia, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.